Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to HDO's web webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about reproductive options and genetic testing with Caitlin Mann. Caitlin Mann is a genetic counselor that works at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. For the past six years, she has focused on reproductive genetics. She's also a faculty instructor in the School of Medicine for the Master's in Genetic Counseling Training Program. We're really excited to have Caitlin join us today. There's been just some slight changes in the language around pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that she'll explain because it's got now a new acronym um, and a little bit more about the IVF process because we know a lot of people understand that this is an option, but maybe not all, all the, the uh, steps that the process entails. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Caitlin. Um, feel free to type your questions into the chat box if you have any questions um, and we will get to them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Chandler. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm a reproductive genetic counselor in Tennessee in the United States. So some of the topics we'll review today may have some nuanced differences in other countries. However, we'll be doing an overview today. So hopefully most of what we talk about is fairly generalizable. So today I wanted to discuss um, the process of in vitro fertilization and kind of what that looks like, along with pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT. Um, and then specifically walking through the options of PGT for Huntington's disease, and then briefly touching on some alternative reproductive options. So in vitro fertilization or IVF is just like it sounds. In vitro means in a simulated environment and fertilization means joining of egg and sperm to create an embryo. So I IVF is quite literally the joining of egg and sperm in a simulated environment, and that environment typically being a lab. So in general, uh, the process of IVF starts out with a couple meeting with a team of specialists. And this team can be quite large, but the most imp uh, important people in this team are the reproductive endocrinologists. Those are obstetricians or gynecologists with advanced training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, along with the clinical embryologists. Those are scientists who either have a bachelor's degree with a certificate or a master's degree, and they help choose fertilization techniques, which will be successful for this couple, and then employ those techniques to the egg and the sperm. There can also be molecular biologists who are experts in molecular genetics and chemistry. There may be cytogeneticists. They detect and analyze chromosome abnormalities. And there may also be geneticists and genetic counselors. So once meeting with that whole team of specialists, um, the next is to go down the route of IVF. Um, and from there, an embryo is typically biopsied or some cells are taken from that embryo. And then genetic testing is performed on those biopsied cells. After the genetic results return, there'd be transfer of the embryo back to the uterus for pregnancy. And then hopefully that would lead to implantation in the uterus by a viable pregnancy and then birth of a healthy baby. So what does that first team meeting look like? Um, there will be lots of initial testing for both the patient and the partner. This testing helps to predict the probability of success with an IVF cycle. So the doctors are trying to determine the availability and quality of eggs, the availability and quality of sperm. Can the egg and sperm meet? And can they success, a woman's body successfully su sustain a pregnancy? So a lot of this evaluation includes things like blood work, ultrasounds, semen analysis, those sorts of things. Um, this process can take quite a while, especially if further evaluation is needed based on that initial testing. So I often tell patients that this can take anywhere from about one to four months. So if everything is clear and we're gonna go down the route of IVF, we'll, they'll begin the process of ovarian stimulation. So typically, each month, um, their one ovary will produce one mature egg, which is then released during ovulation. In IVF, the ovaries are stimulated to produce multiple mature eggs, and that's done by daily injections and monitored by ultrasound. So typically on the ultrasound, we can see multiple eggs growing at one time. 
Then after about 14 days of stimulation, the eggs are retrieved through a surgical procedure. Um, and those mature eggs are then recovered in a test tube, which is walked down to the lab. Those eggs that we recovered from the patient are then fertilized by, um, in a Petri dish, essentially, by um, taking a bunch of sperm and dropping it over the egg. Um, eggs can also be fertilized by something called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or sometimes it's referred to as ICSI. And this is where one sperm is chosen and that is injected into the egg. Um, and this is done really to prevent contamination by other sperm and is actually required um, if we're going to be doing any sort of genetic testing on the embryo. Once fertilized, the embryos are kept in the lab for about three to five days until they grow up to be big enough, either back for transfer or for biopsy for genetic testing. If pre-implantation genetic testing is being performed, then the embryos are biopsied at about day five or six. About four to 10 cells are removed from the embryo. Any more than that is really not safe. Um, the genetic information in those four to 10 cells is majority of the time is the same as the genetic information in the embryo. So those cells are thought to represent the embryo's genetics. And then once those embryos are biopsied, they are frozen and they stay at the lab. And then those biopsied cells are sent off to the genetic testing lab for further evaluation. After results of the te genetic testing have come back, then a normal embryo will be selected for transfer for pregnancy. If pre-implantation genetic testing is not being performed, then an embryo is usually selected for transfer after it's grown for about three to five days. And then the rest of the embryos are frozen for future use. So it's important to note that the number of eggs retrieved does not equal the number of embryos that are available. So not all eggs are gonna be mature, not all eggs will fertilize, and not all embryos are gonna grow appropriately. So on average, if there were 20 mature follicles noted on ultrasound just prior to retrieval, only about 17 eggs are going to be retrieved. 14 of those will be mature eggs. 10 of those will fertilize. Only about six will grow appropriately to day three. And then only about three will continue to grow to day five. Two of those that are grown to day five may implant. And then about one will be alive birth. So each IVF center or clinic is going to have their own data about this and their own pregnancy rates. So it's really important in that initial meeting or even beforehand to ask about those numbers. So what is pre-implantation genetic testing? The idea behind PGT is to be able to test the genetics of an embryo prior to pregnancy, thus avoiding a particular genetic condition for a future child. So once embryos are tested, we hope to get a nice report back that kind of looks like this, where we're able to say which embryos are affected and which ones are not, and thus which ones are going to be most suitable for us to transfer back for pregnancy. There's a couple different types of pre-implantation genetic testing. These were formerly referred to as PGS, or pre-implantation genetic screening, and PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In 2017, the International Committee for Monitoring Assisted Reproductive Technologies, along with organizations that represent many different parts of the world, including the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, got together and put together this glossary of terms that should be used when referring to any assisted reproductive technology. So one of the biggest, yet largely overlooked, changes was the shift from using terms like screening and diagnosis to using the term testing. So now we refer to PGS as PGTA, or pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is when there is a difference in chromosome number. So extra or missing chromosomes in an individual can 
cause genetic conditions, the most common one being Down syndrome. PGD is now referred to as PGTM, or pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders, or that's essentially disorders that are caused by a defect in a single gene, like Huntington's disease. And lastly, PGTSR refers to testing for structural rearrangements between chromosomes. The shift in terms is largely due to the fact that PGT is not 100% accurate. Um, it's really good, it's about 98 to 99% accurate, but it doesn't replace diagnostic tests in pregnancy or after. Uh, the reasons for error are different depending upon which type of testing is being performed but I'd like to discuss PGTM sources of error as it applies to Huntington's. There's really two sources of error that we see with PGTM. One is called allele dropout, which I'll talk about in detail, and then also contamination. Contamination can happen for a lot of reasons. Um, there can be maternal or paternal cells there. There can be unrelated DNA just due to human handling error. Um, and there can also be DNA from a previous sample that's still within that DNA sequencer at the lab. Um, so there's a couple different ways to detect that as well. So what is allele dropout? When an embryo is biopsied, remember we're only taking about four to 10 cells from that embryo. The DNA from four to 10 cells is not nearly enough to perform genetic testing accurately. So the DNA from those cells is amplified, or essentially copied, over and over and over again, so that there's enough DNA to accurately perform genetic testing. And if we recall some basic genetics, we'll remember that we have two copies of every gene. One we get from our mom and the other copy comes from our dad. Each copy of a gene can also be called an allele. So they're the same thing. When DNA is amplified, Sometimes one allele or one copy of a gene does not amplify correctly or does not amplify as much as the other allele. This is unfortunately just a limitation in the technology and not really something that we can actively avoid. Um, and it does occur in about 10 to 20 percent of cases. So what do we do? How do we detect this? We use something called linkage analysis in order to detect allele dropout as well as contamination. The linkage analysis is when the lab goes ahead and adds specific DNA markers that are specific to that individual around the mutation in the family. Typically, they will track mom and dad as well as grandparents down through the family. So in walking through an example, um, over here, there, we're gonna talk about what it would look like without linkage. So the red square is the allele or the copy that has a mutation that we are tracking down through the family. So in example one, we have accurate amplification of the mutation site, which we can see with that red square coming down, and we know that that embryo is then affected. In the second example, unfortunately, there was allele dropout affecting that, that mutation site. So while the embryo is affected, it is diagnosed or reported as normal. So when we add in linkage markers, which are represented by A, B, C, and D, um, this helps us be more accurate. So again, going back to example one, we have there's accurate amplification of both sites, including the mutation site, and the embryo is affected. And that is also confirmed with that linkage analysis. So we can see that A was tracked down to that embryo. In the second example, when there was allele dropout affecting the mutation site, um, we were able to detect that uh, there was allele dropout because of that linked marker, or A, was tracked down to the embryo. So we are able to diagnose that embryo as affected without having accurate amplification of the mutation site. So linkage analysis, is really helpful for us to be able to increase the accuracy of PGTM. I briefly wanted to touch on PGTA as well, because any time that PGTM is being performed, it's recommended that PGTA also be performed. So why, why would we do that? It just kind of seems like an extra test, right? Well, PGTA is to, designed 
to detect differences in chromosome number. So for example, when mom or dad passes down an extra 21, we know this causes Down syndrome in their child. However, majority of the time when there is an extra or missing chromosome, this causes a condition that is not compatible with life and will typically end in early miscarriage. So for example, if there was an extra 22 or a missing four. If PGTA was not done at the same time as PGTM, there is a chance to transfer an embryo that is unaffected with Huntington's disease, for example, but has a chromosome condition that is not compatible with life. So PGTA helps to maximize the likelihood of a healthy pregnancy. It's important to note that the chance of a chromosome difference increases with maternal age. So women are born with all of their eggs and the eggs age as the woman does. So if a woman is 40, her eggs are also 40. As eggs get older, there's a higher likelihood of a chromosome difference. For example, at the age of 35, we expect about 35% of a woman's eggs to have an extra missing chromosome. When we average out the data in cases where PGTM was performed, of those unaffected embryos, about 50% will have a chromosome difference. So it's important to keep in mind it's possible after PGT to have no embryos that are normal. It does not mean all of the embryos were affected with HD. It can mean that the embryo was either affected with HD and had normal chromosomes, or was unaffected with HD but had a chromosome difference, or was affected with HD and had a chromosome difference as well. Okay, so what does the IVF process look like if we're if we're selecting for PGT. So after the initial team meeting and all of the evaluations, and they decide, the couple decides they wanna go down the route of PGT, their blood samples will be collected and will be sent to a genetic testing lab. The genetic counselor, a genetic counselor at the genetic testing lab will be assigned to that couple's case, and then we'll do initial phone consults with the couple. They will talk about what technology their lab uses, how it's done, what the timing of the process is, and then also what types of samples are gonna be needed. In PGTM, we're always doing linkage analysis. So family samples will need to be collected. Ideally, DNA from both parents of an affected or at-risk patient um, is what we would want, however, um, understandably, in HD families, not every, not both parents are always going to be available. Um, so it can be done with one parent um, and possibly other family members. So if PGT is a route that you're considering, please keep in mind that family members are going to need to be involved and they're going to have to be aware that you're going through this process. So it's important to have those discussions with them ahead of time. Once all family samples are sent to the lab, the lab will begin probe development. Probes are essentially magnets that attract the mutation. So this probe development can take about four to eight weeks before it's ready to do testing. So overall, from the time of the initial consult with the IVF team to embryo transfer, the process can really take anywhere from four to 10 months, and that's if everything goes smoothly. Important to keep in mind that that may be longer than you perceive. Um, and it's due to things like dependent upon initial evaluation results, family members not always being compliant when sending in a sample. Um, so this is a long emotional process that is important to think about beforehand. Also, you may get all the way through this where all the samples are at the lab and the lab comes back and says, unfortunately, we are unable to develop a probe for the mutation or for the markers in the family. Um, this doesn't happen very often, but if that was the case, PGTM, unfortunately, would not be an option for reproduction. Okay, so if probe development was successful, there's two different types of testing we can do with HD. There's no mutation testing. That's when we know mom or dad to the embryo um, has HD. We, can, we do direct mutation analysis and then confirm that with linkage. There's also the option to do something called non-disclosure testing. This is when an at-risk individual does not want to know their HD status, 
but does not want to have children who could have HD. So each lab does this a little bit differently and has their own process. So important to talk to the genetic counselor about how this works. Um, but essentially, it's, there's no direct mutation analysis being done. The testing is done with linkage only. And then the grandparent to the embryo who has HD, their genes or their alleles are marked as at risk and then tracked down through the family. When non-disclosure testing is done, embryos are not marked as affected or unaffected. They are marked as normal or at risk on a report. So a limitation of this type of testing is that there is the potential to eliminate or not transfer normal embryos if the parent, mom or dad, is indeed unaffected and did not inherit that expanded HD gene. So for example, it's possible to have inherited a normal allele from the affected grandparent, right? In this example here, grandpa is affected with HD and his alleles are marked as at risk. However, we don't know which A has the expanded HD gene because we don't want to know his son's status. Thus, any embryos that inherit an A from grandpa are going to be marked as at risk but may in fact not have the expanded HD gene. And that's just a limitation of this type of testing. So along the way throughout the IVF process, I encourage you to have a lot of communication with your REI. You decide how much information you want throughout this process. Um, so talk with your REI, talk with the genetic testing lab, talk with the embryologist and say, I only want to know, you know, if I have a normal embryo or not. You can set, you can determine if you want to know the number of follicles you have, the number of eggs retrieved, the number of fertilized, the number of biopsied. But I have a lot of patients who just come in saying, I just want to know if there's a normal embryo for transfer or not. Um, I think this is contrary to a lot of the care provided in this setting. The majority of IVF patients are very information seeking. So to have a patient or a couple come in and say, you know, I actually don't want to know this information, it may cause slip ups or confusion. So be forthcoming, be thoughtful, and be advocates for yourselves throughout this process. And I briefly wanted to touch on other options for reproduction aside from pre implantation testing and IVF. Um, certainly, there's the choice to have a child naturally whether that's for religious, cultural, or financial reasons, um, it's very much an option for a lot of people. Other options that are more along the assisted reproduction route can be things like sperm or egg donors, and then also adoption. There's traditional adoption and something that's becoming a little more popular, which is embryo adoption, um, which is, would allow a couple to adopt, but also experience pregnancy. Um, so all, while PGT is great, it is not the end-all be-all, and there are many, many options out there for every family. So at this time, I'll take any questions that have come up. So I don't think we have any questions, but if people are watching this later on and they have questions um, that weren't answered or that were brought up by this webinar, you can email info at hdyo.org and we can pass them along to Caitlin or make sure that we get you the correct answer to those questions. Um, I wanna take some time to thank Caitlin for taking time out of her schedule. I think this process can be overwhelming in the moment, but also a lot of information for um, an individual or couple um, thinking about going down this route to, to take in. So we really appreciate you sharing not only what the journey looks like, but also some of the reasons that, you know, the acronym or the name have changed. So people are mm -hmm. up on, on what's, what's being said and also so they're not confused when, a, you know, a new name or a new acronym is being used. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.